We're in the book of James on Wednesday. We're looking at James 5. We're in verses 10 and 11. I'm going to do verse 10 tonight. I'll read them both because they go together. He says, <clears throat> it says, an example, brethren, of suffering and patience. Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, talking about Christ. Behold, we count those blessed who endured. You've heard of the endurance of Job, and you've seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. I'm going to deal tonight with an example, brethren, of suffering and patience of the Old Testament prophets. <clears throat> and next week, I'm going to deal with verse 11 with Job, the endurance of Job. And we're going to deal with the key word, endurance. Which is used two times in verse 11 in your Bible. But the subject matter that we're talking about is <clears throat> in verse 10 when he says, Brethren, an example, brethren, of suffering and patience. Then he talks about the prophets, and then he talks about Job. So after a word of prayer, we're going to talk about suffering that's involved in communicating the word here in verse 10, who spoke is laleo, laleo. It'll be on your, it'll be on your sheet in a moment, but laleo means to be communicating something, and we know what they're communicating. They're, and communicating, the word laleo means communicating from you to someone else in hope that they will get it, get the idea of what you're communicating. Does that make sense? That's laleo. Um, an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophet's and here's what they were suffering for, who spoke in the name of the Lord. That's not going to be true with Job, but it is true with the prophets. And so when I come back next week, we'll talk about the suffering of Job that was different than the prophets, yet fell into the same category, and the category is undeserved suffering. We talk about here, we talk about three categories of suffering, undeserved suffering, the prophets are going to be in Job 2. Both of them are the examples of that. Self-induced misery, self-induced misery, and divine discipline. <clears throat> Three ways people suffer. Sometimes they suffer because they've made bad choices, and their choice brings a lot of suffering in their life. Um, sometimes people get into sin, won't confess their sin, and they get disciplined for it, like in Hebrews 12. And there's another category, undeserved suffering, which we're going to talk about both tonight and next week. This is what the Lord, the ministry the Lord gives you in suffering. And it is a ministry. And there are great rewards that's going to come from it in time and eternity, and especially eternity. And especially eternity, and we'll talk about that. So let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. What do I do to get out of carnality and back into spirituality? Of 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, I confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9, a proof text that says, if we confess our sins, speaking to the church, 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Mental attitude, sin, sense of the tongue, and a verse sin should be considered through your responsibility of your priesthood of 1 Peter 2. I give you a moment. Now, Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. It is my prayer the Holy Spirit would minister the truth. Like in John 14, 15, and 16, in John 14, 26, it is the responsibility of the indwelling Holy Spirit in the life of every church-age believer to teach and recall the pertinence of the importance of categorical Bible doctrine in their soul. In other words, that doctrine that is relevant to their life for great change. I pray today we would come prepared in the ministry of the Holy Spirit to allow him to teach us the truth and we'd be acceptance of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're currently in the book of James as those who come to regular class on Wednesday. I speak that to those who are not regular with us by internet. We are in the book of James, and we have walked our way through verse by verse, chapter by chapter, into the fifth chapter, into verse 10 and 11. We will look at verse 10 tonight and verse 11 next week, Wednesday. Um, 2 Peter 3.16 tells us that we must put our thinking cap on when we study the Word of God. 2 Peter 3.16 is a great verse for you to re remember about. Put your thinking cap on. There are often, you come to Bible study, there are difficult passages, there are difficult, difficult concepts. And sometimes because of that, you might think it's over your head. It isn't. It is for your head, not over. And so how that works in your life is through the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't miss his target. Do you have to know everything that is said in class? Probably not. But you should always walk away with something you didn't have when you walked in. That's for sure. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. It's not my job. I can't figure that out. I don't know what all you got going in your life. Don't want to know. It's not important to how I prepare for my teaching or how I teach. My job is just to feed as I feel led to do. Uh, I, so it, I put that on the second point up here. I want us to think about what James is meaning, not just what he says. Because there's where a lot of problems come. Sometimes people, I, I can't tell you how many times people say, well, I heard you say this in class. And I say, well, what would that be? And they will tell me, I'll go back and look it up. I, had, I can do that because we archive everything. And I go, well, how did you ever get that I said that? So sometimes, you know, people filter what they hear. They filter it. So one of the ways you can safeguard that is to be sure that you're under the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit in the teaching hour because John 2, 20 and 27 says, the anointing is to teach you. The anointing ministry of the Holy Spirit is to teach you the truth. He is the spirit of truth and it's his job to teach you. Now, Paul he says something really interesting to all believers at every level of spiritual growth. This is for the baby believer to understand. This is for the immature believer to understand. This is for the mature believer to understand. And you've probably heard this all your life. At some point, you better be believing it because <laughs> the Lord's going to knock on your door. Listen to what Paul says. This comes out of Philippians uh, 1, 29. I didn't put it on your paper. You might, you might need to put that. Philippians 129. For to you, it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only but also. Pay attention to that. Not only but also. Not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. These are two givens. This is Two simple principles of the plan of God in your life. One, he wants you to get saved by believing the gospel that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. 
He wants you to believe in order to be saved. Romans 1.16, the gospel that Christ died for your sins was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. The 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Romans 1, 16 said, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, therefore, you're not saved by works, you're saved by grace. It is a gift, not of works. Those three passages are really important, not only to those who believe, but also to those who suffer for, these are two givens. These are two givens. Now, there are a lot of different ways to suffer, and he's referring to suffering here undeserved. undeserved. How do I know that? For Christ's sake. That's how I know that. Not suffering because I've, I'm into sin. I'm not suffering because I've made bad choices. I'm suffering because of Christ's sake. My witness in the world is trying to be shut down. And uh, the devil would like to use anything God uses to shut it down, right? He gives you the word of God. It rings true in your heart. First thing he does, he comes along and tells you, you don't believe that, do you? Okay? Remember the story of Eve? You don't believe that, do you? Why would you believe that? And then you get into suffering for undeserved reasons. They're like, you don't think a God who loves you would do that to you? What kind of a God would do that to his child? Well, that's a person that doesn't understand undeserved suffering, as we will study over the next couple of weeks. Listen, it's one of the two things given. Believe the gospel, and you can be saved by grace. Suffer for his sake, and you've got suffering grace. You've got saving grace and suffering grace. They're no different as far as grace. They're 100% God, zero man, Right? Both of them. Not just one of them, both of them. Not only, but also. They're both grace principles. When we look at the six stages of grace, we try to mention that. There's saving grace, there's suffering grace, there's dying grace. You know, they're, they're all these things. Yes, one of two givens or grants. <laughs> it has been granted. It has been granted for Christ's sake, that you suffer for Christ's sake. Did you notice that in that passage? It's been granted for Christ's sake. For his sake, you suffer. See? There's a question we might ask in our context, chapters 10 and 11. What is one of James' intentions by which he is teaching in our lesson text? What's he trying to teach us? What's James' intention? What's he trying to teach us? Suffering. Well, it is true, but he's trying to teach you something about <laughs> suffering that's important for you to do. What would that be? Endurance. It's the word that's being repeated in verse 11. Now, certainly undeserved suffering is the subject, but what's he trying to, what, what's intent in teaching it? He's trying to get you to tell them that they'll say to you, you know you're in God's hands, aren't you? There you go. Okay? Endure. Endurance. Endurance. I, I put a blank line there. You see that blank line in your paper? One, two, three, four, four paragraphs down. Of course, my paragraph wasn't very long, was it? Uh, endurance. Endurance. Upomone. Hupomone, endurance. Hupomone. James gives two examples of undeserved suffering out of the Old Testament. Tonight, we're going to look at James 5.1. Next week, we'll look at James 5.11. And we're looking at the intent. What is he trying to get his people to understand about undeserved suffering? He's trying to teach you in both classes that the key for you is to understand what endurance is. And endurance, the hupomone, means to abide under, to abide under. 
to, to stay put, ride out the storm, <laughs> stay put, trust God. Don't worry about what's going on around you or in you. God is witnessing through your life in so many ways that you don't understand. It's unbelievable. Undeserved suffering. Some things you may see, some things you may understand, but you'll never see how big a picture, how much God is using suffering for Christ's sake the witness it has, and how far that witness goes out. Not only that, how far out it might go generational. We've been studying Joseph. His witness went out 400 years. Think about that. 400 years. I mean, not only the witness that flows from you in time, but maybe through generations. A child and a grandchild and a great-grandchild that is connected with your life and it flows all the way out. And from them it flows no telling how many generations. Kind of interesting. Here's my first point. James prepares us for this lesson out of James 1, 2 through 4. See, we're now in the fifth chapter, but in the first chapter, he prepared us for the fifth chapter that was coming. He gave us 101 on suffering. He gave us 101. Now we're into 201 or 301 on suffering. And he assumes that you have James 1, 2 through 4 under your belt. That it's in your soul. It's in your heart. So let's see if it is. <laughs> and if it isn't, then it'd be important to put it there, wouldn't it? Because James 1, you know, the first chapter is going to be helpful if he brings up something more advanced in chapter 5. Would you agree? <laughs> if for no other reason, the Holy Spirit t teaches you that way. All right, so here's James 1, 2 through 4. Consider. Pretty strong word. Consider, that means your mind's got to start. When a guy says consider, you got to bring your mind back into the train station right here. You can't worry about you left the home to go to the train station. You can't worry about where the train's going to take you. Consider. Consider it all joy, some joy, So when you're having a tough day, when you're having a tough day, what's God want you to have in it? Joy. Joy. How are you going to get there? You got to consider that God says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, I don't care what day that is. Because in God's heart, they're all good. Romans 8, 28. And so you got to be sure that your heart is in line with his heart and intent. Psalms 118, 24. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Let us. Let us. I take bacon, lettuce, and tomato. <laughs> lettuce. You tell I'm hungry, can you? <laughs> I'm right off the start with it. Lettuce. I better quit that. I better quit that for sure. Lettuce. I can't. <laughs> Consider it all joy. Brethren, when you encounter various trials or testing, knowing, watch this now, that the testing of your what? Here's what people, here's how people interpret this. 
Here's how they interpret it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, this is how people interpret this. And they shouldn't because that's not what James said. But here's how people, knowing that the testing of your life, it's not the testing of your life, it's the testing of your what? Huh? I'm just telling you what he said, that most people do not say. They say their, their life is being tested. God didn't test your life. He tests your faith. Knowing that the testing of your faith, where's faith come from? How do you know that? <laughs> yeah, where in the Bible? Romans ten seventeen. Romans ten seventeen. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of God. Yeah. Knowing, knowing. See, I've had two words. What's the first word? Consider. You know what my next word is? Knowing. See, I'm going to consider. I'm, what kind of day are you having? Oh, it's not too good. Uh, well, what, how you should you consider it? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That'll bring you some joy, if for no other reason. Now, now I'm in the word knowing, knowing the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance. You know what's going to take you to get through the day? Endurance. <laughs> Persevering. Not only the person going through it, but maybe the one, the caregiver. Think about that. The person holding your hand, walking you through it. And nobody really considers Tony. Nobody says, how's Tony doing today? I'm just saying how other people, we know that you. Yeah. Who, you don't have to say anything. Just tell them this is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. That's what I do. They tell me that. There you go. I shut my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Lord's teaching you something. Knowing the testing of faith produces endurance. That's how you get through the day, endurance. And let, watch this now, and let. Here's another lettuce. And let endurance have its, what? Results. Complete. Perfect. That's because God's made it intent. That's his intentions. Let endurance, which is your race to run, it's your course, right? It's your race to run. It's your course. Let, let your endurance have its perfect result so that purpose Divine purpose, so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking what? Lacking in nothing. You know what that is? That's a concept of logistical grace. Would you agree with that? Yes. And it falls in a lot of ways. Logistical grace falls in a lot of ways. It's the supply of things that you might need to get from noon to five o'clock. <laughs> it may not be. Yeah. It's the things that's required for your endurance. You may have to go through a lot of testing. You, there may be a whole lot of things. And I'm not saying testing from God's side of it, but maybe testing from the doctor's side of it. Let endurance have its perfect. Let endurance, let endurance, let endurance, endurance, listen, endurance has a ministry of its own. Let endurance, you let, you, you run the race that's been set before you. That's your endurance. And endurance has a ministry of its own, inward and outward, so that, you can be complete. You can be perfect. 
lacking nothing. It tells you how you should think about this endurance as it moves through your life. The issue before us today regarding undeserved suffering is not the testing of our lives, but the testing of our faith. All undeserved suffering is directed towards our faith. James 1, 2 through 4. Do you see that? Here's point number two. The reward for endurance of undeserved suffering is given by James in James 1, 12. Here's James 1, 12. See, we just read James 1, 2 through 4. We're still in 101 suffering. He says, blessed is the man or person, believer, who perseveres, that's endures, per perseveres. People in the world would say, you got to reach down deep. You got to persevere. You got to reach down deep with inside yourself and grit your teeth and get through it. See? But the truth of the matter is, what you have to do is endure through the power of the Holy Spirit and the secret of the Word of God in your life, how the Word of God is working in your life to give you contentment to give you purpose, to understand what is God doing. What is God doing? Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he's been approved, that's what God, that's God's part. He will receive, watch this now, the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. He's asking you to endure. He's asking you to run the race. He's, he's, it, which he's talk, talking about like Paul does in 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. Run the race. Finish. Run the race to the finish line. He says in, in that passage, fight the good fight, faith. Finish the course. Keep the faith in the future. There's another crown for you. Here's a crown you get for suffering. Blessed is the believer who perseveres under testing for what he's been approved. He will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. What does it mean to be approved? It means to endure, to, the endu to endure the end of the test. It means to run the race to the finish line. And to do that, you have to keep the faith. And what is your reward? See, this is a reward for endurance. This is a reward. This is a crown you will wear that will earmark you in eternity the race you ran in time. This is a crown that's given at the judgment seat of Christ to those who are in a category with the Old Testament prophets, the Lord Jesus Christ, and Job, and men like that, and women. You're in a category all of your own. It's the crown of life category. You didn't love your life as your own. You didn't love your life as, a, as your own. You understood it was purchased by the blood of Christ, i.e. the gospel. You're not your own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and 20, you've been bought with the price. This is part of that. And this crown of life will be given at the judgment seat, and it's a big deal. You don't wear it now, you wear it later. And it's a big deal because it puts you in an elite class of people. Not everybody goes through, goes through undeserved suffering. Even though you could... Because you've been, it's part, it's a part of the deal, isn't it? To believe and to suffer. 
and most of us will in some form or another before we get out of here. And you'll be an elite class. When you stand up there, you'll go like, I don't really deserve to be here. And the Lord says, you don't think that way up here. You deserve to be in this class of people because you honored my promise to you. You missed it. Blessed is the man or believer who perseveres under trial for once he's been approved by God, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised. Persevere is described by Paul as fight the good fight of faith, finish the course by faith, keep the faith. For the future, there is a second crown that will give it, be given to you. It's called in 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, it's the crown of righteousness. You picked up two crowns out of four and put you in another elite, elite class of people in eternity. And you'll say to the Lord, Lord, I don't deserve this. He said, yes, you do, because you're a child of grace. You live the grace principle. You died the grace principle. And now you see the grace principle applied to you in eternity. You didn't earn this crown. It was given to you by grace. <laughs> because of grace suffering, this crown is given to you. And not only the first crown, but the second one. You pick up two. Two gold medals and not bad. Listen, when you go through this stuff, I don't care what the suffering tag is. Listen. Consider it all joy. And consider whatever you're going through is temporal. What you're going to get from is eternal. It's a promise made by God himself. A promise made to you by God himself. James' first example of undeserved suffering was the Old Testament prophets in the plural. Jesus taught the same principle. Go with me to Matthew for a moment. 23 in a parable he gave. Parable of the landowner. Thirty-three. Well, maybe it's, I don't find it in 23. Uh, let's try... 21. Change that on your paper. It's not 23, it's 21. Let's see, did I say 23? No, 2133. I don't know. I did say 21. <laughs> I don't know why I went to 23. Uh, look at ver uh, 21, 33 through, uh, I guess it's 46. Listen to another parable, Jesus says. This is J a parable of Jesus. There was a lanner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, built a tower, rented it out to vine growers, and then went on a journey. When the harvest time came, approached, he sent his servants, his slaves, to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slave and beat one, killed another, stoned a third. Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. Afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. Sound like the story of Joseph, then. not it? And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, question, what will he do to those vine growers? The people attending 
the Bible study said to him, they will bring those wretched to a wretched end and rent out the vineyard to another vine grower who will pay him the proceeds at the proper season. Jesus opens their scripture to them. The stone which the builder rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, Israel, and be given to a nation producing the fruit of it, the Gentiles, later. And he who falls on this stone, the Messiah, will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will shatter them to dust. Discipline. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, plural, he's been in a series of them, they understood that he was speaking about them. You know who his people he was sending, they were killing? Prophets in this parable. And then when he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they sought to seize him, they feared the multitude because they held him to be a prophet. They were going to do the same thing they've always done. Kill the prophet. Kill the messenger and we kill the message. Unless it comes from God, and how are you going to kill that? I gave you other ideas that Jesus spoke about this same thing. He's trying to tell them they're in a world of hurt if they don't change because they're in a pattern that they've always had, kill the messenger, and you kill the message. And it's never worked. <laughs> now the son is there, and so they're not going to kill the message of the son. They're going to kill the son to believe they can, they can seize the inheritance. What a crazy idea. No respect for God. James earmarks which prophets he's talking about. In James 5.10, he says, who, which is a relative pronoun, spoke, laleo, communicated, in the name of the Lord Christ. In the name of the Lord, which is Christ. Which resulted in, to the prophets, which resulted in the life of the prophets, suffering, the word that's used in the Greek language is a compound word meaning evil afflictions. And patience, which is not the word, true word for patience. This is the word for long suffering. Long suffering. I chose, because I had liberty with prophets who were vocal about Christ and were persecuted for it. I chose Jeremiah. I chose the prophet Jeremiah. And I'm going to mention six things about Jeremiah that if you study his life are, are why, why, at least why I chose him. Now, there are more than six. I'm just giving you six. Jeremiah was known, six o'clock news, Jeremiah was known nationally as a prophet of doom. This is one of the common things. I'm giving you five, five, six common things about Jeremiah that everybody knows about him after they read his book, the book of Jeremiah. Everybody's in agreement on this. Jeremiah was known as a prophet of doom because he preached the coming of the five cycles of divine discipline upon Israel if they did not repent or change their mind about the importance of God as the central figure through Jesus Christ in their national posture. The five cycles of divine discipline is recorded in, Levit in Leviticus 28 and Deuteronomy, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, and is discussed in regard to Jeremiah in 2 Chronicles 36, 21. This is for your study later. Here's what they did. There's what they hated about this prophet, this preacher. He denounced sin, 
publicly. He didn't wait for the people to tell him what was popular opinion of people or not. Well, you know, politicians, that is the way they operate. Look at the polls and see how the people are doing. If the people believe that sin is okay, then they go, they put, they put their stamp of approval on it. If the people go, like, it's bad, then they go, like, well, this is bad, rather than the word of God. Jeremiah, and he lived in a nation that did it just like a nation that we do. You can't call anything that the Bible calls sin today, you cannot call sin anymore. They are slowly trying to take the whole concept of sin out of our vocabulary. They did it in Jeremiah's day, and they severely persecuted him, first publicly, you know, news media kind of business. Then we drew funds and everything else from him to dry, dry him up in his message. Listen, a man of God never needs money to preach. A true man of God is never bought. His message is never bought and paid for by anybody but God himself. You couldn't begin to buy mine. And enough money in the world. Well, Ron, if you didn't, if you, if you didn't preach on sin, we'd give you a bonus, uh, probably. Yeah, probably. Probably. And the Bible declares what it is. And uh, Jeremiah denounced sin in the public square. Whatever sin was going on, he called it by, by its name and declared that if you didn't repent of that sin, in other words, change your mind and walk away from it, it was going to bring discipline upon the nation, not just upon your person. It was going to bring, bring it upon a nation. We're, we're involved in so much sin today in trying to call it good and have even legislated on it and called it good. When you legislate on it, you've just put a nail in the coffin of a nation. And because it's now law, we can't speak against it. And it'll soon come that if you do speak about it, they'll shut you down. And if you won't be shut down, they'll put you in prison and bury you. Because you've committed a crime of law. They have now legislated sin so they can bring punishment to those who preach against it. And I'm afraid many of the church would be on their side. You're supposed to obey the law, not when the law of the land opposes the law of God. You're not. But you take the hit for it if you don't. Like Paul, you go to jail. Like Jeremiah, listen, they didn't put him in prison. They put him under prison. They treated him so bad. They put him in prison in a mud hole where he sank down to his head and it and with rat infested place. You know who protected him? God. Nobody from the community. But you know what? God does. Nobody pays any attention to that one. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Everybody preaches that one. Don't preach this one. This is too close to reality. They put him under the jail. And God left him there for a while and pulled him off, washed him off, said, go get him, Bubba. And he went right back on the street and preached against sin. Priest against sin. And he was so popular, like a Billy Graham, he was so popular 
that they hesitated to kill him at this point. They hesitated to kill him. They thought they'd put him in jail because he went against the law. They put him in jail, suck him up to his head, thinking and hoping that the rats would eat him. God pulled him out, put him back on the street preaching. What's that little bunny that goes around? Energizer bunny. What? The Energizer Bunny. The Energizer. He was like the Energizer Bunny. What a wonderful prophet of God. We should all be Jeremiah's. What an honorable prophet of God. You know, he denounced sin and, and pronounced. He denounced sin and pronounced salvation and judgment. You don't have to take this. But if you guys don't get out of this, listen, you're killing your nation. You're killing the goose that lays the golden egg, you dummies. You've forsaken God. You've forsaken his word. You've twisted the word and you're doing ungodly things and you're going to bring divine discipline in your nation. He says he's going to do it. <clears throat> I'll tell you, they, those politicians sure hate to see him back on the street. How'd he get out of jail? Well, we could only keep him so long. Jeremiah, the prophet of doom, not for him, but for them. He makes everybody so uncomfortable when he preaches on sin. I would bring my family, but my family won't take it. Why? Because they're in sin and they don't like preaching against it. Jeez. What's wrong with us? Jeremiah was known as a weeping prophet because his people lacked interest in the word of God for their life. He wept because they ignored the need for repentance. Later, as I just mentioned, he was later persecuted. You know, how, you know who persecuted him the worst? His hometown. When later, Jesus talks about it himself in Matthew, the 13th chapter. A prophet is never what? Not in his hometown. And that came right out of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was known as a reformer prophet. He was one of the leads in the great reformation of King Josiah. It's an enormous reformation. I mean, it, it, turned, it turned the world upside down. Kind of like Martin Luther in our period of time. It was, a, it was a marvelous thing. 2 Corinthians 35, 25. Once again, he's persecuted for it. Persecuted for it. Remember when Jesus came into Jerusalem? Talking about the weeping prophet. Remember when Jesus, Jesus came into and wept over Jerusalem? Remember that? That's that Matthew 23, 37 through 39 passage. Wept over it. And listen, when they, when they saw him weep as a prophet, they all thought he was a prophet, weep over Jerusalem, they thought of Jeremiah and blew him under the bus. I mean, not only did they throw Jesus under the bus, but Jesus was a, a facsimile of the weeping prophet Jeremiah. And listen, what Jeremiah was telling them, Jesus was telling them, repent or you're going to fall under the fifth cycle of discipline. They both wept over it because the people were not listening. You know, we are in America in the same boat. Not only are people calling sin good, they're calling evil good now. You're in a heap of trouble when you do that, buddy. Jeremiah wrote about the coming of the Messianic New Covenant. 
I've been pounding this for a pretty good while. The new covenant, new covenant. We are new covenant people. Jeremiah was the great writer on this doctrine. Jeremiah 31, 27 through 34. And it's discussed in Hebrews 8 chapter 7 to 13 as coming now historical reality. Or Luke 22, 20, Jesus introduced it as the coming of the Messiah. 1 Corinthians 15, 25, we still celebrate it at the Eucharist. 2 Corinthians 3, 6, we are new covenant people. Jeremiah was the prophet. He was the writing prophet of Messiah. He wrote about the, the second coming or, or the coming of the Messiah under the new covenant. It was Jeremiah who wrote the importance to Christ, the Messiah, the importance of the curse of Coniah. Remember the curse of Coniah? The curse of Coniah is that Jeconiah was the last king to set on the throne of the Davidic kingdom until Christ would set on it in the millennium. It's called the curse of Coniah. No king can set on the Davidic throne until the second coming of Christ. This is the guy who wrote on it, wrote with great clarity, Jeremiah. Now, in closing, why don't you go to Hebrews with me, the 11th chapter, and look at verse 37. I just want you to put your eyes on it. I wrote it on your paper, but I just want, to, I want you to put your eyes on the Word of God. In English, there's three little words. In the English, there's three little words. He gives a discussion out of Hebrews 11, um, up in about, ver when he stops talking about people by name, in verse 32 through the end of the chapter, he runs down a panoramic view of history. And in verse 37, he says they were stoned. Then he says they were sawn in two. Many believe sawn in two was Isaiah. They were tempted. They were put to death with a sword. They went about in sheep clothes, goat skins, etc. And he goes on. Right there, they were stoned. It is believed most, most theologians think that Jeremiah is one of two men mentioned here who were prophets that were stoned to death. One is Jeremiah and one is Zechariah. There's no evidence in the scripture because we don't know about when he died or how he died. But we do know he went to Egypt and it is believed that there, they finally shut him up. They stoned him, whoever it was, his Jews, they stoned him. In the introductory notes, if you have a study Bible, you go to the introductory notes, the introduction notes of Jeremiah, and you will probably learn this, that almost all theologians, I've not read any, who write on introductions of the life of Jeremiah that don't mention this. They're pretty sure that, th that one of these guys was Zechariah because of Luke 11, 50 and 51 is documented and 2, Corinth uh, 2 Chronicles 24, verses 20 through 21. But it is interesting that over the centuries, the information that came down was the two men that are, are most likely to have been stoned to death was Jeremiah and Zechariah. Okay? So, we don't know. But that's what most theologians believe. 
that have done more exhaustive study than I've done on the personal ministry of Jeremiah. What a wonderful prophet. And when John showed up, they thought it might have been him. When Jesus showed up, they thought it might have been him because he denounced sin and pronounced salvation in such clear terms. What a prophet. What a wonderful prophet. I mean, his life sometime is well worth your read. And he lived in a most unique period of, of biblical history. Uh, and God used him in a mighty way to try to turn a nation back to him, along with King Josiah. Uh, and they were able to do it for a short period of time, and the people lapsed right back into sin. And we're not going to have it. And boy, what a terrible fifth cycle they got with Babylon. What a terrible. And Jeremiah, his great ministry hit the, pit, the, the top of his ministry with uh, the great reformation. And then he was, he was the prophet there when uh, the fall came to, to Babylon. Uh, and was hardly, listen, you know what's interesting? He was highly respected by his captors. His own people trying to kill him. And they said, I can't believe it. This, and they highly respected him. They said, you, they said to him, listen, you can go with the people. Or you can stay here. And he said, well, and he decided and he stayed. It's just interesting. He, says, he lived an interesting life like all of us. Man sold out for Christ. A man sold out for Christ. We must never waver. Yeah, do not fear what man could do to you. Fear, fear what God will do to you. Fear what man could do with you. He can't do anything God doesn't sign off on. Can't do a thing. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these who have come our way by the automobile and the internet. We pray, Father, that people might, might have their appetite wet to study this great prophet Jeremiah. A lot of, a lot of times he's quoted out of the New Testament uh, because of this. Pray that we would have the same bold courage to speak the truth of God without compromise. Lay it out there. Denounce sin and proclaim salvation by grace. Pronounce sin. Denounce sin and pronounce salvation by grace. We'll be all right. We'll be all right. Don't condemn the sinner. Condemn the sin. We'll be all right. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.